Today, we're going to hear about Natty Bumpo, and we're uh, very honored to have the president of the Hoosick Falls Historical Society, uh, Joyce Brewer, being here today to talk about that. Now, basically, all I know is it was a book I had to read in high school. Uh, I saw the movie, and I loved Daniel Day-Lewis playing Nat Natty Bumpo, and beyond that, I didn't even know it was a real person. So today, Joyce is going to inform us on the truth about Natty Bumpo and the work they've done at Cusick Falls to commemorate him. So please join me in introducing Joyce Brewer. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for having us here. Uh, like I said, I'm Joyce Brewer. I'm the director of the Cusick Township Historical Society and the Lewis Miller Museum in Cusick Falls. And I'm actually... Uh, we're teaming up today to do this presentation. Corrine Eldred is going to come in and speak first about who is Natty Bumpo and, and the stories, the history of Natty and how we came about. And then I'm going to talk after that all about Natty Bumpo Day. So I'd like to introduce Corrine Eldred. Hello, everybody. So good to see there's so many people that are interested in our Natty Bumpo. I want to start off by telling you how this got started. It was about this time last year when, um, when Mr. Phil Leonard and I were cleaning out one of the storage rooms at the museum. And there was a box, and actually I think it's on the floor. Or did she? Yeah. Okay. There was a big gray box in on the shelf, and it said on there, Nanny Bumbo, leather stocking. So I had seen that box numerous times, so I, I asked, uh, I asked Phil, who's Natty Bumpo? Because we're always, him and I write for the, uh, the monthly newsletter, so we're always looking for stories. And um, so he told me that Natty was a fictional character in J.F. Cooper's novels, and that um, people from town thought that he actually based him on a um, person that lived in the town of Hoosick. So I said, well, I'm going to take that box home and just go through it and see what's in there. So that's what I did. I took it home and went through it all and went back to the museum and told them how it, it was a conflict that started back in 1865 and it was never resolved. So we never finished it and, and who's it falls at. So we got together and thought, well, we need to finish the story. <laughs> so that's how it all got going. Um, <clears throat> That was over 150 years ago, and the rest is history. So let's just do a little background first. I'm J.F. Cooper. As some of you probably know, Cooper was the 11th to 12 children born to Judge and Mrs. William Cooper. The family moved to Otsego County when he was only one year old. At age 13, he entered Yale University, only to be expelled two years later because of a prank. <laughs> then he joined the Navy in 1908 and married in 1811. At the suggestion of his wife, she was a smart lady, he started writing. Throughout his career, he wrote a number of books, but the Leather Stocking series was the most popular, and it made him an international name. The first book in the series, The Pioneers, was considered to be the first truly American novel. He went on to publish four more, finishing with The Deerslayer in 1841. Nanny Bumpo is the hero in each one of those books. The hunter, the trapper, the friend of Indians, the frontiersman, though he goes by other names throughout the series. Names such as Leatherstocking, Hawkeye, Deerslayer, and Pathfinder. So that brings us to Nathaniel Shipman. Who's Nathaniel Shipman? Well, as the legend goes, Nathaniel was found living in the Lumsac Valley sometime between the last French and Indian War and the start of the Revolution. Beyond the fact that his daughter, Patient Shipman, became the wife of John Ryan, very little is known of him. <coughs> He was a hunter and a trapper and spent much of his time in the woods. He was a friend and companion of a few Mohican Indians that still lived in the area. They lived together, hunted together, and fought together against the French and their Canadian Indian allies. 
The legend goes that he was a noted scout for the British. When the War for Independence broke out in our area, <clears throat> Shipman refused to join the Americans because of his loyalty and friendship with the British. Therefore, he remained neutral. Well, that didn't go over too well with his neighbors in Olmsted, and because of this, he was branded a Tory and tarred and feathered. Then he disappeared, skipped town. Years passed and no one heard from him. His son-in-law, John Ryan, had become the most well-liked citizen in the village. And as a boy, he came from New York City to Hoosick Falls as a land agent for the heirs of one of the original proprietors on the Hoosick patent. He served as town supervisor for a number of years. He was an assessor and an overseer of the poor. For several years, starting in 1806, he served in Congress as New York State Assemblyman, spending much of his time in Albany. It was here that he met Judge William Cooper, and the two became friends. The judge shared with Ryan the trials and adventures that he had encountered in um, settling his large land estate in Otsego. He also told Ryan of an aged white man who lived in a hut or a cave on the border of Otsego Lake. Describing him as a famous hunter with some celebrity in the French and Indian War. The judge was a great admirer of the old hunter with his simple habits and quaint speech like his Indian companion. He was a true son of the forest. When Ryan related the stories to his wife, she immediately thought of her father, who had been missing for 26 years. And she begged him to go to Cooperstown, to Otsego Lake, and check it out. Making the journey of several days on horseback, Ryan discovered his wife's notion to be true. After some urging, Shipman returned with him to Hoosick and was cared for by the Ryans till his death in 1809. He was buried in the Ryan lot in the old burial ground behind the First Baptist Church. So you're probably wondering how we learned about the story of Nathaniel. Here's the man responsible for our early history in Hoosick Falls. He came to Hoosick Falls in 1833. Actually, he was born in Vermont, Wilmington, Vermont. I could go on and on about this remarkable man, but let me just mention a few of his attributes. He was the wealthiest man in town and used his wealth for the betterment of the community. He donated land and money and built the Ball Academy and the Phoenix Hotel. He served as president and mayor of the village for 12 terms and also served in the Civil War. When he returned from the war, that's when he started researching and documenting the history of the town of Hoosick. He called it Annals of Hoosick. In the early 1870s, the annals were printed in our weekly newspaper, the Rensselaer County Standard, and have been preserved down through the ages. That's how we learned of Nathaniel Shipman. Mr. Ball heard the story from the locals and investigated further, sending out letters to former residents. We'll hear a little bit more about those former residents later on. The leather stocking tales were still very popular then. When he discovered who Shipman was and where he was buried, he marked it with an oak slab in the word leather stocking, intending to follow up with a suitable monument in honor of his memory. So, this is the article that was um, published in the Troy Times in 1865 that seemed to start all the trouble. It seemed like a good idea at the time, however it backfired. This is the lady that started all the trouble with Hoosick Falls. <laughs> Sophia, her first name was. She claimed to be a descendant of David Shipman, whom she believed was Cooper's inspiration for Natty Bumpo. She was an avid reader and kept up with all the news of the day. She found the Hoosick Falls 
story in three of the major newspapers, and she quickly wrote to all three, saying that Hoosick Falls was making a big mistake because David was buried in Otsego County, not Hoosick Falls. This was the beginning of the controversy that would go on for the next hundred plus years. Now I'll highlight some of the documentation that we had stored in that big gray box. This man was the pastor of the Presbyterian Church and appointed by the Hoosick Falls Committee to speak on its behalf. He challenged Mrs. Mallory to produce evidence. She responded that she had a Bible which belonged to David Shipman and that it contained handwritten entries on the birthdays of John Ryan, Patience Ryan, and the date that David Shipman departed this life. Correspondence between the two only added more confusion for both sides. DeWitt ended his conversation with her with that quote. We do not intend to resign our claim if we can hold it, but added that no monument will be erected until the issue is clarified. In 1874, the editor of the Rutland County Standard was threatened with prosecution to the fullest extent of the law if he should dare erect a monument over the grave in Nathaniel's leather stocking. Next. In 1875, a year later, the Honorable Levi Chandler Ball died, but the story lived on. Each county came out with a publication of its history, and included in each was the conflicting story of Natty Bumbo's origin. 1878-1897. In 1902, word began to circulate that Hoosick Falls was again raising money for a monument. Mrs. Mallory stated that Hoosick Falls would be committing a grave mistake avoided almost four decades earlier because Cooper had confided to her father that her leather stocking was the real one. Sophia knew that she had descended from a very real David Shipman. She constructed a letter stating that there could have been two shipments with similar habits, but she would concede no more. There could have been a Nathaniel, but there could not have been a patient's father. But he could not have been a patient's father, so he must have been her uncle. And then she died the following year, 1903. Who's at Falls kept the story alive. In 1911, during Old Home Week, James Beckett, local resident historian, published the story of leather stocking in a local newspaper. A year later, the same story was printed at Siegel Farmer. 1950, posted in the New York Sun and the Bennington Banner. 1916, a story was presented, this is kind of funny, his story was presented at the 18th annual meeting of the New York State Historical Association in Cooperstown. In 1933, the Siegel Farmer article, Old Controversy Over Shipment, still goes on. So a few years will by after that, and then um, in 1956, after reading this article in the Daily Times, or Utica Daily Times, Warren Robinson, who's at Falls, started a three-year debate with, with columnist Ted Townsend. Warren was 78 years old when he started this. He was retired. He was always interested in the story of Nathaniel Shipman. So when his friend gave him a copy of the newspaper clipping, it ended, the story ended with the statement, was Nathaniel Shipman Cooper's Nathaniel Bumpo, or was it David? Who knows? Well, that comment was all he needed to, to start a debate with, with this editor from the other newspaper. Uh, during the early months of 1959, Robinson got a letter from Townsend saying that 
He couldn't help him any longer because he had retired and moved to Florida. But he suggested to send his articles, he suggested that he sent his articles to the Freeman Journal in Cooperstown. Robinson didn't let him off the hook though. After all the time and effort that he spent, he wanted to know if he had convinced um, Ted Townsend that our Nathaniel was the real inspiration for Natty. And he did end up sending him a postcard and said, I believe you're right. And then Robinson died in 1966 at the age of 92. But that man was persistent. In 1963, this five-chapter book was sent to the Cheney Library before ending up at the museum. Mr. Shumway lived in New York City and had a family connection to the Mallory's. The family always believed that the two boys were brothers. No, and this is a quote from that book. Nobody can be completely sure who the Shipman brothers were or where they came from, but the author has, has completely has a completely developed theory, theory, which is explained in the next chapter. Later, he called it a hypothetical reconstruction. <laughs> Sounds to me like a legend and lore. <laughs> Edie Beaumont, probably some of you know her because she was a longtime reporter for the Bank and Banner. She researched and wrote extensively on the controversy in 1969. The photo of the cemetery shows the bare space where Shipman was buried in Lot 104, according to our cemetery records. Uh, later on, Edie served as curator of the museum for over 14 years. So that's pretty much our timeline on the debate between Cooperstown and Music Falls. But lastly, I would like to show you 10 reasons why we believe in Nathaniel. <laughs> a scout in the French and Indian War and served to a British officer. He was a friend and companion of Mohican Indians. David was in the Revolutionary War. Nathaniel was tarred and feathered for refusing to enter. In one of the, his novels, Natty said, I'm the man that got the name of Nathaniel from my kin, Hawkeye from the Delawares. Natty's not an abbreviation for David, but for Nathaniel. His rifle, left to his son-in-law, John Ryan, was of unusually long length as described in the novels. Dr. Benjamin Walworth and Azariah Eddy were the former residents that Ball wrote about earlier. Remember, I told you we'll talk about them later on. Those are the two residents. Um, Benjamin Walworth knew Nathaniel as an elderly man and described him as a hunter, scout, warrior, full of stories. Azariah Eddy was given a copy of The Pioneer shortly after it was published by a friend, and on the flyleaf was written the name of Benjamin Walworth as the leather stock. Music Falls possesses a shipping corpse, or Cooperstown does not. That's a big one. We <laughs> got the body. Nathaniel <laughs> lived in a cave on the bank of Otsego Lake, and David lived in a cabin at Oak Creek and died in his son's house. So that's our story, and we're sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening, and now I'm going to give you back to Joyce to show you the scenes from Natty Bumble Day. <laughs> Thank you, Kareem. So, yeah, so after we found the box and we started doing all this research, Kareem and Phil and I worked diligently on this, um, we decided that what we would do is we had gotten a postcard in the mail from the William G. Pomeroy Foundation for the different types of markers that you can get. And they have one called Legends and Lore. So we thought, how perfect this really fits, this story fits with the Legends and Lore. So we did all the research that we needed to do, and we sent everything in to the William G. Pomeroy Foundation, and they granted us the Legends and Lore marker. 
So then we decided we needed to put together a big day. We needed to have Natty Bumpo Day. So that's what we did. Um, we started out, uh, some people have the programs that we gave out that day, July 13th, um, 2019. We declared it Natty Bumpo Day in Music Falls. And so we got together. This is a picture of from the First Baptist Church uh, Cemetery. That's actually their pastor walking down through after the cannon fire that started our day off. And this is the Second Continental Artillery uh, reenactment group from Fort Edward. And they were the ones that kindly came and participated with us. Pledge of Allegiance, of course. Here we are gathered down on the main road where we have our marker. If you're familiar with Music Falls, when you're driving down Main Street, uh, toward the village square, you will see on the right hand side of the road the red and cream uh, Legends and Lore marker for Natty Bumbo right before the First Baptist Church. And I'm talking. A couple of our board members participated in it. John McNeil spoke about the culture of the James Fenimore Cooper writings, about what was happening at that time in our country. And Kareem, as she spoke today, spoke to, talked about the, um, the documentation for how we got to declare Natty Bumpo Day. And then Mike Chapman came as Natty Bumpo. Some of you probably know Mike and Phyllis. Uh, they participate a lot at the monument. Uh, I know he always does the reading um, on uh, July 4th. He reads the Declaration of Independence. and. Uh, Great, great guy, as Ned. Um, and then Kendall Baker shared some history of the First Baptist Church. So the First Baptist Church uh, was the first meeting house in Hoosick Falls. And what it was was before there was lots of churches and different things, lots of different organizations and groups used that building. And as the village grew around 1827 or so when we incorporated, the first church that became too large to be um, held inside the meeting house was the Presbyterian Church. They went off. They started their own church. The next largest group that was in there were the Baptists. So they actually took over the meeting house and it became the first Baptist church. The first church was torn down and they built another church. But as you can see in all three of those pictures, the cemetery is still shown in the back and along the side of the church. Mark Sardam, our, our town supervisor and councilman, Eric Sheffer, they declared July 13, 2019, Natty Bumpo Day with a proclamation. And our, our mayor, Robert Allen, um, also came and spoke. We did challenge him to be like Levi Chandler Ball and to have 12 different um, times as mayor. He doesn't think he wants to do that, though. <laughs> and then uh, my daughter, Samantha Brewer, actually read a letter of proclamation from the William G. Pomeroy Foundation. And here we are unveiling the Legends of Lore Marker. And like I said, you can see that, stop in and see that. And then we went up into the cemetery. So as Kareem had showed you and told you that there used to be a headstone, a, a wooden slab for Nathaniel Shipman in the cemetery, has long since deteriorated and was gone and there was an open spot. So what we did is we decided that we needed to make sure that everyone in the future knew where Nathaniel Shipman was buried. So we went and spoke with Dave Began, who owns the Monumental Works in Music Falls, and he had a headstone there that had not ever been picked up and never actually been finished. There was some etching on it. It was from around 1900. And so he said that it would, we would be able to buy that headstone from him, and he took it up to Barry, Vermont, and he had it shaved down. And, uh, and then he went ahead and had some um, engraving put on it for us, and then we installed that in the cemetery right where Nathaniel is buried, and so now he has his own headstone again. 
And here's the picture unveiling the headstone. And you're free to go up into the cemetery anytime you want and look around and, uh, and read that headstone and read some of the other ones also. Um, the, the church cemetery had kind of been in a little rough condition. It's, it is the oldest cemetery in Hootsie Falls. And uh, they were, some of the stones were pretty rough. They were starting to fall over and hadn't really been maintained as they probably should have been. So a group of us got together a couple weeks before this event and we cleaned most of the headstones, as many as we could. And some of the members of the Baptist Church came out and they helped uh, write some of the headstones and fix them. So this was a good thing because it really it made everybody aware of the cemetery and what it needed and what, what type of things it needed to have. So that was good. It got fixed up and, and cleaned up and kind of has a new rebirth. And here is Mike and, and Phyllis posing with the headstone. And one of the things that we wanted to do is not just declare Natty Bumpo Day and talk just about Natty Bumpo, but we wanted to bring more awareness of the time. We wanted to um, involve more people that we could. So we asked the Pioneer Fish and Game Club to come, and they brought a display, and uh, they talked with the kids and all the people that were there about the time frame. They talked about what the hunting and fishing and trapping was like. And we also have a group of kids in our town. It's called the um, Summer History Institute. And what they do is they participate mainly around the week of the Bennington Battle. And they spend, an, they spend an entire week learning about the battle. They learn about the time of, uh, you know, that time frame. And they get all dressed up and they sleep at the battlefield the night of uh, overnight at the battlefield and everything and so they came and participated also and so that was pretty neat to have some some young kids there and then like I said the second artillery they brought their cannon uh, that was fun that to have a cannon fire and then here are some close-ups of the legends and lore marker and of the headstone And that's it. So thank you. So now we're ready to, uh, if anybody has any questions, we can take questions or comments. Yes, sir. You said it used to be a wooden tombstone. Yes. A wooden a tombstone. A yes. Right. Wooden marker, marker at one point. The photo you showed shows the gap. My question is, how do you know there's actually a corpse there? <laughs> it's in our cemetery reference. Did you see the cemetery reference? <laughs> and that has the location? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, so Actually, cemetery goes, yes, and that's just one, one page of the cemetery records. We have numerous cemetery records from that cemetery that shows um, either Nathaniel Shipman's name or it just says stocking on it. So. There was an evil marker. Yeah. Yes, I can try to back up. Spot 104. 104? Yeah. Yep. Yes, this, this one here says actually says leather stocking, and then a couple other ones that we have say Nathaniel Shipman on them. And the other, yes, sir. What was Cooperstown's reaction to all this? No, actually, there wasn't. Uh, Kareen, <laughs> when we first started this process, before we replied to the, to the Pomeroy Foundation for the Legends and War Marker, Kareen reached out to Cooperstown Historical Society. And they pretty much said, we don't care. <laughs> the guy, he just, he sent you back an email that was like, eh. Yeah, he, uh, he told me that the you know, story was online if I wanted to read it. We already had the story from Cooperstown because the book she sent to the library. But they didn't seem interested at all, which is kind of surprising. Yeah. We were a little concerned, though, as, as the day got closer and closer and closer to the Natty Bumpo Day, we were afraid that Cooperstown was going to come back and all of a sudden want to, like, have a fight again or something, but that never happened, so that was good. <laughs> they get a lot going on in Cooperstown. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, did Cooper himself ever say who inspired the character? Actually, he said that he used different people. He didn't say that he used one. He said that he used different people. He could have used both, you know, David and the thing. So whatever happened to David, you said he's not buried in Cooperstown? 
No, he's buried, he's buried in Arecibo County. Oh, okay. Somewhere around Fly Creek area. Yeah, but there is the no point. there is no headstone and there's no marker and there's no specific place where he is buried. It's near Cooperstown. It is near Cooperstown, yes. It is. But even even then in Fly Creek there is no cemetery record or any specific burial spot for David Shippen. Well, we hope that everybody comes down to Hoosick Falls and stops in sometimes and then uh, visits the Legends and Lore Marker and visits the cemetery and uh, it stops in at the museum and sees us. We have uh, lots of great stuff going on down there. So thank you all very much. Thank you.